Hi everybody, I'm Miss Lassar and I'd like to welcome you to your first lecture video. Here's the deal with the lecture videos. Your goal is to get all of the content from this lecture into your notebook. A general rule of thumb is if it's text on the screen, write it down, but you can be smart about that and you can use paraphrasing and abbreviations to shorten the amount that you're writing down. Pause the video if you need more time to write. Rewind as necessary. This is your lecture. Make it work for you. Here's the content for today's lecture. We're going to be talking about four topics. Number one, matter and energy. Number two, feedback loops. Three, ecosystem services. And four, the tragedy of the commons. Let's start with matter and energy. Matter is a concept that you're familiar with from chemistry. It's what makes up the world around us. Matter is the physical stuff that we and all of the things around us are made of. It has weight. It has mass. It's made of atoms that are connected together into molecules, small, gigantic, two atoms together in a molecule, thousands of atoms together in a molecule. And matter can be living, like the matter that makes up you, or non-living, like the matter that makes up a rock or a piece of ice. Matter includes solids, liquids, gases, and it can transition from one of those states to another. And during that transition, it doesn't lose matter. It doesn't lose mass. It's the same matter, just more tightly packed, more loosely packed, with more energy or with less energy. And on Earth, matter is conserved. We will be returning to this concept in a little bit when we talk about the law of conservation of matter. We sort matter into two categories, organic and inorganic matter. Organic matter is defined as containing hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are molecules where carbon atoms are bound to other carbon or hydrogen atoms. Organic matter is generally material that is in a living organism, was in a living organism, or was made by a living organism. That's actually why it's called organic, because organic molecules are almost always required to be made by a living thing. Carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids are all examples of organic matter. So are things like ethanol, which is the alcohol in alcoholic beverages or made during uh, lactic fermentation, and fossil fuels like methane or petroleum. Those are all organic molecules. Inorganic matter does not contain heart carbon, with one exception, carbon dioxide contains one carbon atom, but is not organic because the carbon is not bound to another carbon or to a hydrogen atom. Inorganic matter includes things like water, H2O, minerals that make up rocks, atmospheric gases, etc. You are full of both organic and inorganic compounds. They're both found in living things. Organic compounds are only able to be made by living things. So returning to this idea of conservation of matter, the law of conservation of matter states that during a chemical reaction, matter cannot be created or destroyed. Here's a chemical reaction. This is the chemical reaction during the combustion, the burning of natural gas. Here's the natural gas, methane, CH4. And when we burn it, we burn it in the presence of oxygen, O2. And these molecules are rearranged into new molecules during the reaction, carbon dioxide and water. And if we count up each atom on the left-hand side, for example, oxygen, we've got one, two, three, four oxygen atoms. And then we count them up on the right hand side, one, two, three, four. The number of each type of atom is the same on the left hand side before the reaction and on the right hand side after the reaction. Here's a summary. Even though matter may change from one form to another, for example, a liquid, this is a gas, to another gas and a different liquid, the same amount and type of atoms exist before the reaction and after the reaction. Moving on to energy, I want to start by giving you a bunch of examples of the two different kinds of energy. We tend to sort energy into two categories. The first category is kinetic energy, which is probably what you think of when you think of energy. This is the energy of motion. Within the category of kinetic energy, we've got 
Mechanical energy, the energy due to the motion of an object, a moving bicycle has kinetic energy, has mechanical kinetic energy. Electrical energy, the energy from the flow, the physical flow of electrical charge. Thermal energy, heat energy is a type of kinetic energy. Light energy is energy from moving electromagnetic waves. And sound energy is energy from vibrational motion. So our other category of energy is potential energy, and it's just as important. This is stored energy. For example, chemical energy is energy that is stored in chemical bonds. This is the energy that's stored in a battery or stored in your food. Your food gives you energy because there's chemical energy stored in the bonds of the molecules in your food. Nuclear energy is energy stored in atoms' nuclei. Gravitational energy is energy stored in an object's height above the ground. And elastic energy is energy stored in elastic objects. Some things to know about energy on Earth. Energy is what puts matter into motion. The primary source of energy for life on Earth is the sun. That's what powers photosynthesis. Leaves are able to capture that energy and transform it from light energy into chemical energy, which then gets passed up the food chain. There is one exception to this. Uh, at deep sea under thermal vents, where there is no access to sunlight energy, there chemosynthesis happens. And that is a process that uses chemical energy to create a different form of chemical energy, make organic molecules, and pass chemical energy up the food chain. On Earth, energy is not conserved. So earlier, you wrote down that on Earth, matter is conserved, which means that the total number of nitrogen atoms on Earth is roughly not going to change. We're going to ignore exceptions like shooting material out into space or material entering the atmosphere from space because that is such a small, small fraction of the matter on Earth. On Earth, matter is conserved. So the total number of nitrogen atoms is the total number of nitrogen atoms. They might get rearranged into different molecules, but the total will be the same. Energy is not like that. Energy is not conserved. There is constantly energy coming in through the Earth's atmosphere, and it's solar energy for the most part. We have solar energy coming in, and we're also losing energy all the time. We lose a lot of heat energy and infrared energy. So we lose a couple different types of energy that can radiate out of the Earth's atmosphere. So let's talk about these energy transfers and the movement of energy. The first law of thermodynamics, our first law of energy transfer, is otherwise known as the law of conservation of energy. And this states that energy is never created nor destroyed. It's just transferred from one form to another. Let me show you some examples. When a leaf absorbs light energy from the sun, it transforms that light energy into chemical energy stored within the bond of a glucose molecule during the process of photosynthesis. When an animal, say you, eats that leaf, chemical energy is just physically moved from one body to another in the process of consumption. And if that glucose molecule is, say, torn apart and used to build a larger molecule inside the animal. It's still chemical energy that's just being transferred from one molecule into a different molecule. When that food is broken down and is used to fuel the chemical reactions in your body that lead to your arms and legs moving, that chemical energy has just been converted to mechanical energy. And finally, if you use your arms, your moving arms, to clap your hands together, that mechanical energy has just been converted into sound energy. So those are all energy transfers. At the same time, during those energy transfers, something is happening to that energy, and it's dictated by the second law of thermodynamics, which states that every energy transfer results in a loss of quote-unquote useful energy. It's also phrased like this, every energy transfer makes the universe more disordered and entropy is a measurement of this disorder. 
So this is sometimes referred to as the law of entropy or the saying entropy increases. Here are some examples. When your body breaks down food and uses it to create the mechanical energy that moves your arms, some of that energy is lost, not destroyed because energy is never destroyed, but it is lost as heat energy. When you move your arms and legs, you start getting a little warm and that is a loss of the chemical energy as it's transformed to heat energy, which is really hard to recover. Living things can't access that heat energy and use it easily. Similarly, when you clap your hands together, you're transferring mechanical energy into sound energy, but some of that mechanical energy is lost as sound energy, which is hard to recover, and again, heat energy, which is really hard to recover. Let me show you an example of a chemical reaction that demonstrates all of our laws, conservation of matter, first law of thermodynamics, and second law of thermodynamics. And you're welcome to record this chemical reaction and some of these examples on your paper. Here's our chemical reaction formula. When we mix vinegar and baking soda, which you may have done before, a chemical reaction happens that transforms the vinegar and baking soda into an entirely new set of molecules, sodium acetate, water, and carbon dioxide. And we can already see the law of conservation of matter here, because if we count up the number of carbon atoms on the left side, it will be the same as the number of carbon atoms on the right side. So let's watch this chemical reaction proceed. We've got our baking soda. We're about to drop it into our vinegar. And perhaps you have done this experiment before when they mix together, a violent chemical reaction happens and all of these bubbles and this foam is produced. And that is evidence that our original molecules are being transformed into a new set of molecules. So how can we apply our second law of thermodynamics? Uh, here are the energy transfers that we see. Some of the chemical energy that was stored in the bonds of the vinegar and baking soda is converted into mechanical energy. We can see the mechanical energy of the moving foam pouring outside of the container into sound energy. The volume wasn't on on this video, but you would be able to hear the bubbling. And we lost some energy. It wasn't destroyed, but it was transferred into less useful energy, like sound energy that we can't easily recover. Uh, some of the heat energy in the environment is actually transformed into chemical energy. If you did this experiment in real life, you would feel that the solution starts getting cold. And that's because heat energy from the environment around this reaction is being taken into the experiment, into the reaction, and is being transformed into chemical energy stored within the bonds of these product molecules. Our next section is feedback loops. And this might also be review from biology or from chemistry. If this feels familiar, that's awesome. We've got two types of feedback loops. The first is a positive feedback loop. Positive feedback loops promote change. Negative feedback loops resist change or counteract change. I'm going to show you examples of both of these types of feedback loops to illustrate what they mean. But before I do, it's important to note that the words positive and negative do not refer to good or bad effects. And they also don't refer to whether the effect is increasing or decreasing. They refer to what's happening to the change positive loops promote change and negative loops counteract change. So here are some examples. Here are two negative feedback loops. On the left, we've got feedback loops that come into play when your body temperature changes. As body temperatures increase, systems come into play to reduce body temperature back to a set point. And you know how this happens. Your body temperature increases. You start sweating. As the sweat evaporates, it cools off your body and your body temperature decreases. So our temperature initially increased and then we decreased it back to our set point. We changed and then we reversed the change. Here's a, an example in environmental science. In uh, orange, we have the population of our lynx, which is a predatory cat that eats 
hares, which are a type of rabbit. As lynx populations increase, they deplete the hares population so much that the lynx population begins to decline. Our lynx population increases, and then when they run out of food, lynx start dying off and the population decreases. We had a change, the population increased, and then we reversed the change, the population decreased. Here are two positive feedback loops. On the left, as a bank balance grows, interest accumulates at a faster rate, speeding the growth of the account balance. If you have a savings account, you may have seen this happen. The more money you have in the savings account, the faster your interest accumulates, which will increase the value of your savings account, meaning you'll uh, accrue interest faster, increasing the balance more, accruing interest even faster, and the speed at which your savings account grows continues to increase and increase and increase and increase. And we do not reverse that change. On the right-hand side, an example from environmental science, as ice sheets melt from direct contact with water, more water is able to slip underneath the ice shelf, speeding up the melting of the ice sheet. So our change is the speed of melting. And as that ice sheet or ice shelf is exposed to more water underneath it, more water in direct contact with the ice shelf, the rate of melting will increase which means that more of the ice shelf will be exposed to water and it will melt even faster, exposing more of the ice shelf to water, melting even faster. And our rate of melting continues to increase and our change is not reversed. Our third category for today is a concept called ecosystem services, otherwise known as what can the environment do for you? The benefits that an ecosystem service that an ecosystem provides to humans are called ecosystem services, and we separate them into four general categories. Our first category of ecosystem service is provisioning services. These are physical things that can be taken from an ecosystem and used by humans. Our second category we call regulating services. These are services that keep the environment stable or livable or prevent environmental damage or keep the uh, air, water, land around us livable for humans. Cultural services are the mushy, hard to define benefits that are so unique to us as humans with cultures, with tourism industries, with time for recreation. Cultural services include cultural, recreation, economic, spiritual, tourism, or aesthetic benefits that an ecosystem provides to us. And our fourth category is supporting or habitat services. These are benefits provided to organisms that humans rely on. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of examples from all four categories for a particular ecosystem. The ecosystem that we'll use as our case study is a coral reef. And I chose coral reef because it is a vibrant biodiverse ecosystem, but more importantly, because it is a natural ecosystem. When we're talking about ecosystem services, we are only talking about natural ecosystems. For example, a farm would not count as a natural ecosystem, and you would not talk about the ecosystem services provided by a farm. But let's take a look at our natural ecosystem, the coral reef, and let's look at some provisioning services, things we can physically take out of the coral reef and benefit from. A coral reef provides compounds that could be used for medicine or therapeutics. For example, there are some really cool heart medications in development from cone snail toxin, a highly toxic snail found in coral reefs. So cool. Coral reefs also provide many communities with food sources. Food is such a great ecosystem service to fall back on. Be specific. What is the specific food that is being gathered from that ecosystem? From a coral reef, we would gather grouper, eel, and shark species that are all eaten for food. And finally, coral reefs provide fish and materials like 
corals that are important for the, the aquarium and the pet trade. Notice that in all of these examples, I was specific and there was a clear benefit to humans. Our next category, regulating services. This is keeping the environment stable, livable, preventing damage from natural disasters. Coral reefs provide protection for coastal ecosystems from flooding and wave power or wave erosion. I want you to picture the fabulous movie Moana and how when Moana ventures beyond the reef, all of a sudden she encounters massive oceanic waves. And those massive waves disappear at the reef line because they actually hit the physical structure of the reef and their kinetic energy gets dissipated amongst the structure of the coral reef, lessening the height and power of the rave, waves and preventing the coastal communities from flooding and from erosion. Coral reefs also maintain a livable habitat for commercially important species by reducing carbon dioxide concentrations in the water through the process of photosynthesis. So this one's a little complex. The key to an ecosystem service is it must benefit humans. So if we just said coral reefs maintain a livable environment for fish and for algae and for corals by reducing carbon dioxide concentrations in the water, that would not be good enough because we need to say how those organisms benefit humans. So we can throw in this line, they are commercially important species or commercially important organisms. And that means commercially important to humans. Our next category are our cultural services, the fun stuff. Coral reefs provide tourism opportunities on beaches near the reefs. They provide recreation opportunities for scuba divers and for snorkelers. If you're stuck on a cultural service, think tourism and think recreation. Those are pretty easy ones to fall back on. And our final category are the supporting and habitat services. So what is the reef doing to support organisms that we rely on? Coral reefs provide habitats for commercially important species. Sea provisioning, for example, as you wrote some down, eels, grouper, some shark species, some organisms that are important to the aquarium trade. If you were asked for an ecosystem service of a coral reef and you just wrote, they provide habitats for clownfish, that would not yet be an ecosystem service because an ecosystem service needs to specifically benefit humans. So if you wrote, coral reefs provide habitats for clownfish, which are important for the aquarium trade, now you've connected it to humans and now it's an ecosystem service. Coral reefs also provide breeding grounds for commercially important species. This is a pretty easy sentence to fall back on. In an ideal world, you would know what are some examples of species that actually rely on coral reefs for their reproduction. Our final category for today, our final section for today, will be about the tragedy of the commons. This is a defining theory in environmental science, and this theory states that individuals, all of us, acting in our own self-interest will inadvertently overuse and deplete common, which means open access, resources. On the bottom of the screen, you can see one of the classic examples of the tragedy of the commons, overgrazing of a common pasture. In our left picture, we have minimal grazing of the pasture. Use of the commons below is below the carrying capacity of the land. And so all users benefit. There's not too many sheep on there. They eat grass, but the grass is able to regrow quickly enough so that it doesn't get depleted. But in our middle picture, if one or more users increase the use of the commons beyond its carrying capacity, the commons becomes degraded. Now the sheep are eating the grass faster than it can regrow. The cost of this degradation is incurred by all of the users because now these sheep are not getting enough food. In our final picture, Unless environmental costs are accounted for and addressed in land use practices, eventually the land will be unable to support the activity. So this final picture represents depletion. 
Let me give you some examples of the commons. When we say the commons, we're referring to open access resources. That's something that anybody and everybody has access to. For example, public access grazing land. There is some public access grazing land left in the United States. At this point, large chunks of grazing land have been purchased and are privatized, owned by individuals who might sell off those rights, but there are some regions that are public access still. Unregulated fisheries or fisheries that everybody has access to and anybody can fish from with impunity, without limits. A public forest where anybody can access it and has the ability to cut down a tree and harvest that tree or harvest some other thing from the forest without the fear of incurring a fine. So I'm not talking about a forest that you can walk into, chop down a tree, and if someone catches you, you get a fine. That's a regulated forest. I'm talking about a forest that is unregulated, a public forest where individuals can come in and use it for their own benefit public access groundwater that everybody has access to. The atmosphere. It's really hard to regulate the atmosphere because how do you regulate what we put into the air? Uh, roughly anybody can put whatever they want into the air around us and with some exceptions for certain substances and gases that are regulated in the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is a commons that we all have access to. Privately held resources may still be depleted. There's nothing stopping that, but they aren't considered commons and they're not what we refer to when we're talking about the tragedy of the commons. We do have solutions to, to the tragedy of the commons. We can prevent this. We can reverse some of the damage if we haven't completely depleted a commons. The first solution is privatization. This means giving individuals ownership over smaller chunks of the resource. The theory here is that if an individual owns the natural resource, it will be in their economic interest to not allow it to go to ruin. They will change access fees to use the resource, charge access fees to use the resource, and they'll manage it to prevent overexploitation. If you are in charge of your own space, you are incentivized to take care of it because as the owner, you need it to stay good, to stay available, to stay productive for the foreseeable future. An example of privatization would be somebody who owns a pond or who gains ownership over a pond, charging fishermen for the right to access it and limiting how many people do access it. They are in control of their resource. They're limiting access in order to prevent depletion of that, of that resource. Our second solution is public or government management. Instead of giving ownership rights to individuals or corporations, uh, we give ownership and management to the government. This typically looks like limits, laws, and regulations. The government will set limits on exploitation and will create a set of legal penalties for those who do not obey those limits. This looks like catch limits in fisheries. And this is something that you might have encountered if you've ever tried to go fishing in the Potomac River. To go fishing in the Potomac River, you need a license. And if you don't have that license and you're caught, you're charged a pretty hefty fine. That's an example of one regulation to prevent the number of people who access the resource. There are also catch limits for certain fish. You can only have two striped bass during the summer season per person, but you can have four striped bass during the winter season. And our third solution is a local cooperative. This works in small groups. Small groups can successfully agree on reasonable limits and practices without the oversight of a governing body. You might have seen this if you've ever worked with roommates or classmates or friends to decide, okay, we've got to fix our behavior. Here's how we work in order to make sure that our apartment doesn't get too messy, that our dishes are always washed, that we're not overusing the toilet paper. Here's the system and we all agree to it. One environmental example would be lobster fisheries in Maine, small communities that have come together and decided on reasonable limits for the amount of lobster that they can fish. This is 
enforced just by the local cooperative. There is not a legal penalty set for this. This is a unofficial agreement between members of a small group. All right, that was your first lecture. I hope that your notes are awesome, complete, detailed, and if you're missing something, rewind this video, go get that information, and we will see you in class.